In the following video, I'd like to discuss with you the management strategies of posterior capsular rupture in patients operated for posterior polar cataract. This is my cumulative experience where I will be sharing nine different case scenarios of posterior polar cataracts wherein there was a PCR. We will discuss in detail how the PCR occurred and how the cases were salvaged. What makes the polar cataracts at a higher risk of a PCR is the fact that you have an abnormal opacification of the posterior pole, an abnormal adhesion between this polar opacity and the posterior capsule, as well as an abnormal inherent fragility of the posterior capsule. The first important consideration is the fact that a PCR in a polar cataract is almost always intraoperative. It's an extremely uncommon occurrence where you can see an existing PC rent preoperatively on slit lamp examination. Let's now move to watching the different case scenarios of an interoperative PCR in a polar cataract. Now there's one thing I need you to understand. In this patient with a posterior polar cataract, the epinucleus is being removed. Following the removal of the epinucleus, what you can see out there is not an opening in the posterior capsule. It is a mere condensation of the posterior cortex, which typically is seen in patients with a polar cataract. Let's move to the next case. In this case, you will notice that as the surgeon is aspirating the epinucleus, you can see a posterior flaying open of the posterior capsule. This is typical of an opening in the posterior capsule in patients with a polar cataract. In this particular case, since there was no vitreous disturbance, with the help of a bimanual irrigation aspiration, with care and caution, the cortex is removed. You can see here that the last part of the cortex was removed using a Simco. Moving on to the next case. Here is the patient with a classic polar cataract. The nucleus management was uneventful. But notice while doing the irrigation aspiration, the surgeon notices the classic linear tear in the posterior capsule, typical of a polar cataract. Now, whilst the bimanual irrigation aspiration is going on, I can see that the opening in the posterior capsule has not enlarged, signifying that there is no vitreous disturbance. So, I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to bringing the irrigation out of the eye. Noticing that the PC opening has not enlarged any further, I proceed with care and caution to introducing the single piece monofocal IOL of a plate haptic design within the capsular bag. It is then rotated so as to lie at right angles to the opening in the posterior capsule. This is a stable end result. Now here's another case of a posterior polar cataract with a NS2 nucleosclerosis. Following the capsular rexis and the hydrodelineation, the surgeon now starts to perform a direct chop. The first two chops were uneventful, as you can see. I now rotate the nucleus and when I attempt to hold on to the nucleus and bring it out, notice how the nucleus starts to sink. I decided to perform a posterior assisted levitation wherein a 26 number needle was introduced past planar behind the nuclear fragments and the nuclear fragments were drawn out into the anterior chamber. Having achieved this, I then created a scleral tunnel and then brought all the nuclear fragments out of the eye. As you can see, viscoelastic was introduced into the anterior chamber, the posterior lip depressed and the fragments removed. A limited anterior vitrectomy was then performed in the cut IMO to clear the vitreous, followed by the removal of the cortex in the IA cut mode, as you can see here. Under adequate viscoelastic cover, a rigid single-piece monofocal IOL is then dialed into its place within the ciliary sulcus. And this is the end result that we achieved an anterior chamber free of vitreous and a stable rigid IOL in the ciliary sulcus. Let's now move to the next case. This is a patient with a posterior polar cataract with almost no nucleosclerosis. Following the capsular rexis, a hydrodelineation is successfully performed to delineate the endonucleus. Under adequate viscoelastic cover, we proceed with the phaco emulsification. But at the onset of the phaco emulsification, we can notice the presence of a central PCR with a posterior bird bowing of the cortex. 
Having noticed this, the first thing I do before removing the phaco probe is perform a viscofluid exchange. Since till this point there is no vitreous disturbance, I choose to go with a bimanual irrigation aspiration to aspirate this soft nucleus. Clearly, as you can see, I found it quite challenging. I now attempt to ascertain whether or not the vitreous is disturbed by injecting some transcendent into the eye. With the help of a 20 gauge vitrectomy cutter, I then clear the vitreous, which is disturbed. I then proceed in the eye cut mode, as you can see, to remove the soft nuclear material. I then perform a viscofluid exchange prior to swapping my hands. Now using the IA cut mode of the vitrector, I then complete the removal of the entire nucleus. The cortex is also similarly removed. The tear in the posterior capsule is converted into a stable opening with the help of an intraocular forceps and then we introduce a single piece monofocal IUL with care and caution within the capsular bag. The haptic from the anterior chamber is now flexed into its position within the capsular bag. The aisle is then rotated to lie in such a position so that the haptics are at right angles to the opening. And as you can see, we have achieved a stable end result. Now the next case is a patient with a posterior polar cataract with a fairly dense nucleosclerosis. You can see that performing hydrodelineation in these cases can be rather challenging. When the surgeon attempts to perform a direct chop, let's see what happens. As you can see, the first chop went well, the nucleus is then rotated, and the surgeon attempts to chop further. Having downsized the nucleus, we can now see the emulsification of the individual fragments. But look what suddenly happens. Notice how one of the fragments starts to fall back into the posterior segment. Now what does the surgeon do at this time? Now because of the one or two free floating fragments in the anterior chamber, they are carefully emulsified ensuring that there is no vitreous disturbance, followed by a viscofluid exchange prior to the removal of the phaco probe. As you can see that the vitreous is disturbed here, the surgeon then proceeds to clear the vitreous by performing a limited anterior vitrectomy and a cortex removal using the eye cut mold. The important lesson here is that when you have a fragment that starts to fall in, you never go chasing the fragment and try and bring it up. The best option is to let the fragment go, clear out the vitreous and the cortex from the anterior chamber, as well as place a rigid or a three-piece IOL within the ciliary sulcus. These wounds should then ideally be sutured prior to handing it over to our VR colleagues to then remove the dropped nuclear fragment from the past planar root. This next case, as you can see, is a patient who's undergone a past planar vitrectomy. There is the presence of silicon oil in the anterior chamber. It's a very soft cataract with a posterior capsular plaque. At the end of nucleus management in this case, there is a posterior capsular plaque. Now let's see how that was managed. An opening was made adjacent to the plaque with the help of a cystotome and you can see how just with the help of a cystotome I'm able to propagate the tear just beyond the plaque and complete the tear all around this plaque. In this manner the plaque is now separated and as you can see will then be pulled out carefully with the help of McPherson's forceps. At this point we have a stable capsular bag with a small central opening and an anterior chamber free of vitreous and therefore we chose to introduce a single piece monofocal IOL within the confines of the capsular bag. At the end we had a stable end result. The one step that you do not perform in a patient with a posterior polar cataract is performing a PC polish. While polishing the posterior capsule, notice what happens. The surgeon actually ends up with a PCR. Under viscoelastic cover, with the help of an intraocular forceps, this irregular tear in the posterior capsule is converted, as you can see, to a round, stable posterior capsular excess.
Having achieved this, you can see how now a three-piece IOL is safely placed and dialed within the confines of the capsular bag. The end result was a stable IOL in the capsular bag. Moving to the second last case of our series, remember that even a stromal hydration, if performed with excessive force, can result in a PCR as it did in this case. So remember in polar cataracts, when performing a stromal hydration, make sure not to apply over excessive force while hydrating the incisions. Coming to the last case of our series, this patient presented with a grade 2 nuclear sclerosis with a classic polar cataract. Having achieved a fairly ideal capsular excess, we proceed with the hydrodelineation. Following the hydrodelineation, we now proceed to perform a direct chop. This part of the video will demonstrate the technique of direct chop that is used to downsize and emulsify this nucleus. The nucleus management was uneventful. Following the completion of the nucleus management, I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to performing the epithelial removal. Following the removal of the epinucleus, a viscofluid exchange is further performed and now let's see what happens when we perform the bimanual irrigation aspiration. The cortex removal seems to be going on fine until this point. Upon the removal of this cortex, see what I can see. I suddenly start to notice the presence of two linear lines in the posterior capsule, signifying the occurrence of a classic PCR in this polar cataract. Having noticed this opening in the posterior capsule, I now perform a viscofluid exchange prior to removing the irrigation from the eye. As there is no disturbed vitreous, I continue to remove the rest of the cortex with the bimanual irrigation aspiration itself. At the end of the irrigation aspiration, I perform a viscofluid exchange and note now how with care and caution, I am actually able to implant a multifocal IOL within the confines of the capsular bag. At the end of the case, you can see that we achieved a good end result. This has been my cumulative experience of managing posterior polar cataracts with open posterior capsules. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.